Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. How HDAC inhibitors work is actually unknown. There's a range of hypothetical mechanisms of action based on what HDACs do. And so we have um, theories such as the fact that they modulate gene expression through modifications of histones. But there's also the possibility that they could modify the action of a whole range of cytosolic proteins through changing the acetylation status of cytoplasmic proteins. And it's not clear uh, which mechanisms predominate. And it's highly likely that in different patients, different mechanisms have different levels of uh, value in terms of disease response. In some of the early work that we did in the non-myeloma setting, we saw extreme differences in response, for example, in myeloid uh, leukemic patients, which range from tumor lysis in some patients to not seeing responses for three or four months. So clearly the mechanism of action in that context was widely divergent and would, one would have to extrapolate that the same circumstance may occur in myeloma. In our present experiences, one of the most uh, gratifying things we've seen is that we've been using panobinostat in a post-transplant setting as a single agent. And we've demonstrated that patients who remain longer on the drug actually develop deeper and deeper disease responses, which suggests to us that either it is truly working as an epigenetic modifier, or perhaps it's through immune modulation, which there is certainly some evidence for with HDAC inhibitors. So how they work is unclear, um, but I think one of the key things in our experience is to try and keep people on therapy to at least give them a chance to respond to the agents, because I do think they work very differently to the other agents that we presently have available. Regarding the efficacy profile of panobinostat, I think that there's uh, the very nice data from the Panorama 1 study as well as the Panorama 2 study. And so the Panorama 1 study uh, was in patients with one to three lines of prior therapy uh, and the improvement in progression-free survival was approximately eight months to 12 months. Uh, so a statistically significant as well as a clinically significant or a meaningful benefit with a four-month improvement in progression-free survival as well as, an importantly, an improvement in the depth of response, since so we see almost a doubling in the depth of response and the CR rate that goes from 15 to 27 percent. However, when you look at the U.S. FDA indication, uh, it's actually in patients not in all one to three lines of therapy, but those patients specifically who had prior bortezomib and lenalidomide and then after two lines of therapy. And in that setting, we see an improvement in the progression free survival from four months out to 12 months. Uh, which I think is significant with a hazard ratio of 0.5. So I think in that setting, there's a really, I think, a significant addition with panobinostat, showing really a clear benefit in that combination. Uh, we've also seen the uh, clinical activity of panobinostat in other clinical trials as well. So when we look at the combination of panobinostat plus IMIDS, and so Dr. Chari recently presented data with the combination of panobinostat and lenalidomide in relapsed refractory myeloma, showing very nice response rates uh, in that 40 to 50 percent range including in patients who are uh, lenalidomide refractory as well. So I think that there's clear activity in combination with IMIDS. Small trial, we have to learn more about it, but I think clearly there's a very nice uh, signal of activity there that can help overcome both velcade resistance as well as lenalidomide resistance. And there's three nice trials now in combination of panobinostat with carfilzomib uh, from Jesus Berdeja at Sarah Cannon uh, at MD Anderson and then at Emory as well. Uh, showing you very nice response rates and in fact uh, when you look in the one to three lines of prior therapy or patients who had a median of three lines of prior therapy, the response rates are as high as 70 to 80 percent from Jesus Berthelius data. Uh, and in later lines of therapy it's around 40 percent in patients who are truly velocated refractory. And so I think very nice response rates even in that setting as well. So I think we're starting to see an efficacy profile with panobinostat based therapy with other combinations other than bortezomib as well, which I think is very appealing. So regarding the toxicity profile of panobinostat, I think this is also an evolving story as well. Just like any other new class of drugs when it comes onto the market, we all have to learn how to better manage or understand and identify those side effects and manage that. And that's something that we see with any new class of drugs. And so with panobinostat, we see GI side effects with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, as well as fatigue and some thrombocytopenia as well. 
I think the key is that uh, understanding and recognizing diarrhea and so being very proactive about that. So nowadays, when any time patients get panobinostat, they should have Imodium or supportive care with them. So as soon as they get their first bout of diarrhea, they should be proactive and take Imodium right away and stay on top of their hydration. Uh, we can also consider dose reductions as well as necessary, down to 15 milligrams from 20 milligrams of panobinostat, and that can be very helpful as well. Regarding fatigue, I think the best way to manage that we've seen is either a dose reduction in the panobinostat or dose delays in therapy. And so if they have some significant uh, fatigue, we'll have a delay in their therapy for a week, allow them to improve their performance status, and then as they acclimate to the therapy, uh, their fatigue improves as well with time. The second key point to recognize as well is that many of these side effects that we see is actually with the IV administration of bortezomib. And so in our experience, when you use sub-Q bortezomib or once weekly bortezomib, because much of this data that we have right now describing this toxicity profile that's concerning is with the use of IV bortezomib given twice weekly, which is what we really don't use in the U.S. very frequently. So almost 90% plus of our patients receive sub-Q bortezomib and they receive once weekly bortezomib. I think with that uh, partner drug that's changed, we've seen a much different side effect profile. So uh, in the clinical practice, we've actually seen very, very little diarrhea, um, less than 10%, as opposed to the significant diarrhea that we saw with the use of IV twice weekly bortezomib. And so I think that's gonna be an evolving profile. And when we look at actually the combination of carfilzomib and panobinostat, we see a five to 6% incidence of diarrhea. And the same thing with IMIDS, when you combine with lenalidomide, we see very little diarrhea. So I'm not sure it's really the panobinostat that's driving the diarrhea um, and the GI side effects. I think it's a partner drug that can also contribute to this as well. But given all that, I think it's important to be proactive uh, with the use of Imodium, counsel our patients, educate them that we can see diarrhea with this. And if you do, go ahead and take Imodium right away uh, and have that with you and stay on top of your hydration. Panobinostat in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone is approved for the treatment of adult patients with multiple myeloma in relapse or refractory after at least two prior lines of therapy, including the administration of bortezomib and an immunomodulatory drug. The optimal dose of panobinostat in combination with bortezomib plus dexamethasone is 20 milligrams daily via oral, given three times per week, one, three, five, the following week, days eight, 10, and 12, followed by a week risk period. So panobinostat will be given two weeks on, one week off, Bortezomib, the conventional dose, 1.3 milligrams per square meter, IV or sub-Q, on days 1, 4, 8, and 11, followed again by a 10-day risk period. And dexamethasone is usually given 20 milligrams the day on on the day after bortezomib. This uh, particular combination, uh, panobinostat, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, I think that uh, covers, again, uh, the unmet medical need that we have when we have in front of us a patient in relapse and refractory who has previously received the approved combinations and now here in Europe include bortezomib and thalidomide and or lenalidomide. But what from my point of view this combination clearly represents is that panobinostat is an agent with a different mechanism of action and in fact, is the first agent different to PI and IMID approved for the treatment of myeloma patients. So this is what it's really interesting for me of this combination, the new mechanism of action, the possibility of acting in a different pathway to the proteasome inhibitors and IMIDs. And this is the reason why I consider this combination would be attractive for relapse and refractory myeloma patients.